Guess who's facts? Facts again. Ten more facts. Tell some men. So the fascinating facts series of videos we did, adapted from the series of articles on whatculture.com by Justin Henry, or as he's known around the office, Sexy Justin, people seem to enjoy though, so we're going to do it again about King of the Ring. Why? Well, first of all, despite being estranged from the WWE pay-per-view family for a while, King of the Ring used to be, for a period of about two or three years, one of the big five, aka the only pay-per-views that WWE used to do in a calendar year, acting as a bridge between Mania and SummerSlam. Second, some Mania facts are well known, but how much do you actually know about the former institution that led to just so many many king gimmicks. So many awful, awful kings. There's one. I'm Plumpy from whatculture.com and here are 10 fascinating facts about King of the Ring 1993. Number 10. It took place in the heartland of America. 1993's King of the Ring emanated from the Nutter Center in Dayton, Ohio. Despite being the sixth largest city in the Buckeye State, WWE apparently felt insecure running a pay-per-view out of there because they saw it as a B-town. It's been said that Vince McMahon sometimes feels his product comes off as second rate when associated with the littler towns and nixes the mentions of them. Basically, f Dayton, Ohio. F you guys with your hang on a second 141,000 people being named one of the best places in the United States for graduates to find a job and all of those innovations in aviation you guys. Instead of the announcers constantly name-checking the city they're in like they do on regular pay-per-views Jim Ross, Randy Savage and Bobby Heenan would often use the catch-all phrase we're in the heartland of America which bit? It doesn't matter which bit! Number 9. The USWA title was defended in the dark match. In 1992, WWE struck a partnership with the Memphis-based United States Wrestling Association run by Jerry Jarrett, father of the original Slap Nuts, Jeff. In the early days of the collective, Jeff Jarrett appeared in a number of local house shows while Jerry Lawler, its headline star, joined the broadcast team and wrestled occasionally. In trade, some of McMahon's talents would appear at USWA shows and would even populate the heavyweight championship scene. Papa Shango, who was fairly directionless by 1993, makes sense. He's Papa f***ing Shango won the belt from Jerry Lawler just a few months before this pay-per-view, in fact. In something of an unorthodox move, Shango actually defended that belt in King of the Rings' untelevised pre-show, taking on a still babyface, Owen Hart. Shango won that match, but dropped the belt to the youngest Hart sibling eight nights later in Memphis. He held it for just two weeks. Number eight, the commentary was broken. Jim Ross made his WWE debut at WrestleMania 9 a few months earlier, partnering with Bobby Heenan and macho man Randy Savage. Togas aside, and sounding crazy high-pitched compared to the draw he's become famous for, Ross worked well, slotting into the earnest foil to Bobby Heenan roll. The three-man crew reunited for King of the Ring, where their performance wasn't as well received. The collective timing was a bit wrong, often playing off each other a bit poorly and occasionally talking over each other. The reason for the poor showing was actually a technical issue with their headsets, meaning they had a hard time hearing each other. It's certainly a far cry from modern-day WWE when three-man commentary teams are always excellent. Otunga, always. Otunga, always excellent. David Otunga. Number seven, Bret Hart wrestled with an injury for more than 40 minutes. Across his three matches at 1993's King of the Ring pay-per-view, Bret Hart wrestled four 47 minutes and 32 seconds, carrying what would have been a mediocre show at best without his execution-related excellence. Hart actually worked all three bouts with an injured ankle sustained the previous evening when, of course, the hitman was working his hands to the bone at Madison Square Garden. Instead of working a basic house show match, Hart and fellow babyface Bob Backlund put on a clinic inside the garden, during the course of which Hart sustained a noticeable ankle injury. The match went more than 32 minutes long, with Hart coming out on top. It was Backlund's first pinfall loss ever at the garden. In all, across the two days, Bret Hart performed four matches, totaling one hour, 19 minutes, and 53 seconds across a 24-hour stretch, 600 miles apart, and with a goddamn ankle injury. How, Brett? How are you so good? Number six, the photographer was a familiar face. The championship bout pitting Hulk Hogan against Yokozuna had to follow what was probably the company's best match of 1993, Hart's semi-final with Mr. Perfect, and there was no chance they were going to top it, even without the hokey bollocks finish, and it was really bad. In the closing moments of the match, a photographer disguised as, I can only call him Hobo Joe, jumped onto the ring apron and somehow shot a fireball out of a gimmick camera that rendered Hogan prone for a Yokozuna leg drop. Montreal wasn't the first time a contentious champion lost to their own move. That mysterious paparazzo? It was none other than manager Harvey Whippleman, who would have been passed off as a Japanese cameraman in on the fix with Yokozuna and Mr. Fuji, with his true identity never being revealed. Seriously though, is that Hobo Joe's dad? Number five, Hulk Hogan still performed for WWE afterwards. A common misconception is that Hogan flew the WWE Coop after dropping the championship to Yokozuna at the June pay-per-view, saying, see ya, brother, before making excellent movies like Mr. Nanny and Thunder in Paradise. But that wasn't the case. Hogan still appeared in numerous events over the ensuing couple of months, although no more mentions were made of Hogan on television. Shortly after losing the belt, Hogan pulled out of a number of scheduled dates, save for some late June house shows in Chicago and Boston. Hogan also performed as scheduled for a sizable tour of Europe in late July, early August, working WWF championship bouts against Yokozuna in front of packed houses. Hogan's official last match with WWE took place Friday, August 6th, 1993, defeating champion Yokozuna by disqualification in Sheffield, England. He would sign with WCW almost a year
year later in June 94. Number four, Bret Hart put Hogan on blast backstage. Do not mess with Bret, he will swear at you. The hitman had been led to believe by Vince McMahon that Hogan would be dropping the WWF Championship to him at SummerSlam in an old generation, new generation passing of the torch. Previously, Hart claimed that following WrestleMania 9, Hogan told the hitman he would be happy to return the favor down the line and put Hart over. Shortly before King of the Ring, in what Hart summarized as some bullshit, he found out that Hogan was apparently reneging on that promise. McMahon told Hart that Hogan was refusing to do the honors, and after Hogan returned to his dressing room following his loss to Yokozuna, Hart stormed it and confronted him over Hogan's apparent change of heart. As Hogan stood there speechless, Hart finished off his verbal torrent by telling Hogan he could go f*** himself. Number three, Jim Ross alluded to IRS's past. In early 1990s, it was par for the course for recognizable veteran wrestlers to be remade with over-the-top gimmicks in WWE with no mention of their previous lives. The Iron Sheet became Colonel Mustafa, Ricky Steamboat was streamlined as simply The Dragon, and Mike Rotundo was reincarnated as Erwin R. Scheister, IRS. Jim Ross went way back with Rotundo, calling his matches in NWA WCW, and JR damn sure knows his wrestling history. As a fountain of facts, Ross revealed during an eight-man tag at King of the Ring that Scheister was a four-time WWF World Tag Team Champion. In addition to his reigns with Ted DiBiase as Money Inc., Shyster had two prior reigns with Barry Windham in 1985 as the US Express, but not as IRS. Way to break kayfabe, JR. Number two, Bret Hart became the only two-time King of the Ring winner. Though this was the first King of the Ring pay-per-view, the concept dates back to untelevised house shows that WWE would run in New England areas in the 1980s. Therefore, the tournament has some lesser-known victors, including Don Morocco in 1985, Harley Race in 86, Randy Savage in 87, Ted DiBiase in 88, Tito Santana in 89, and even Bret Hart in 91. When Hart won the first televised version in 1993, he became the first and today only man to win the tournament twice. His 91 runs at the top was less auspicious than his brilliant 1993 path, including wins over Pete Doherty, the Boston-based ring veteran, not the Libertines frontman, although now I want to see that match and only that match, then Skinner, before felling IRS in the final. Number one, Jerry Lawler legitimately injured Bret Hart. Hart's consolation prize for losing out on the Hogan match turned out to be a critically acclaimed feud with veteran Jerry Lawler. The story began at the pay-per-view's conclusion during Hart's coronation after defeating Bam. Bam, Bam Bigelow. Lawler confronted Hart with a claim that he was the only true king in the WWF, straight fire. Then Lawler jumped Hart from behind and assaulted him with the royal props that were on the staging area. At one point, Jerry lifted up the wooden throne and threw it down forcefully onto Hart, leaving him in a crumpled heap. By Hart's recollection, he would have a hard time taking a deep breath without pain for months after the altercation. Thanks, Jezza, you stiff. <laughs> 